Good morning. How are you doing today? Good. We're going to be looking at Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, so you probably want to turn there. Now, one thing I want to bring up to start with is that if you look today, we have been told over and over and over phrases like, follow the science. And every time I hear that, I start thinking like, what are you talking about? Because one thing that true science does, true science uses the data to modify the theories. It doesn't use the theories to modify the data. Now, I'm only a few sentences into this message, and you're probably saying to yourself, what does this have to do with Romans chapter 7? Well, we're going to get there in a few minutes, and you're going to see why I'm talking about this and how we're going to tie it into Romans chapter 7. But what I want you to remember is, if we're looking at anything to analyze it, it is the data that needs to modify the theory, not the other way around. And what happens is you get your data, you bring up your theory, you see how it matches, you then refine the theory according to the data, you then get more data, you refine your theory, and that's how you keep learning things, whether it's science or whatever. One of the things that we've heard a lot about over the last few years is global warming and climate change. Okay? Now, I'm not here this morning to try to change your opinion on that issue, but I'm going to bring it up because this does relate to what I'm talking about here. Several things that are interested with the climate change narrative is that if you remember back in 2009, we had what was called Climate Gate. A little later, we had more recently, we had Climate Gate 2. And Climate Gate was when they found all these emails being exchanged among the leading climate scientists of the world, literally saying things like, How do we fake this data and modify this data to support our position? Should have blown everything apart, but it didn't. They doubled down on it. But it was amazing. If you actually read some of the emails, it was unbelievable what was being said among, among these people. In addition to that, what we've seen is there's data manipulation in that there's been historical changes of the data. Now, we can argue about what the temperature is today, but if we look back, let's say, 1960 on January 12th at a certain spot, we shouldn't say, well, it's one thing and next year that temperature dropped because it's the past. But what they're finding is NOAA has actually been revising the old temperatures downwards to make it look like there's more of a change. In addition to that, they've looked at their temperature sensors, and the temperature sensors are placed, they're finding, for example, next to airport runways. Well, obviously, it's going to be hot there. They're placed next to roads. They're placed next to asphalt. Temperature sensors, to be effective, are supposed to be in areas that are not impacted by anything around them. They're supposed to be in wooded areas or whatever, okay? What they're finding is it was around 90% of the sensors they were using were wrong. And not only that, they're finding when the sensors go bad, if the temperature is elevated, they're not replacing them for several years at least. This that happened at the National Airport a couple years back. In addition to that, you've all, we've all heard 97% of all climate scientists agree that global warming is occurring. Anybody know where that number came from? I can tell you. It's made up. And not only was it made up, but if you look at that number, what happened was originally there was a woman, I believe it was a woman, she got literally thousands and thousands of studies, or survey answers rather, from climate scientists, okay? And of those thousands and thousands of, sur of surveys, she picked 67 that she liked. And lo and behold, after picking out the 67, she found that 65 agreed with her, that global warming was occurring. So therefore, 97% all agreed. Well, that doesn't include the tens of, the, well, the thousands at least, if not 10,000 that she threw away and didn't use. That number has been repeated since then. That number has no basis in fact. As a matter of fact, there are many who don't believe it, but they're afraid to say it. One of the things is, if you give me, any, I don't think, let's say that somebody was saying the world is flat. Okay, I don't believe the world is flat, okay? But let's say, oh, I could fall off the, no, never mind. Let's say that you say the world is flat, okay? If you do that, and then you said also, by the way, you have control of all the journals, and you have control of academia, and you have control of the government funding for grants. You know what happened? I could probably get 90% of the people to agree the world was flat because they want to be published. But if you don't get published, you don't get tenure, you don't advance. What's happened in climate scientists, and some of them are now coming out and saying this, they've had to lie in their journal articles in order to get published because they know if they tell the truth, they won't get published, period. If you don't get published, if you go often heard in academia, publish or perish, they mean it. If you don't get published, you're not going to go forward. Worse yet, in a few years back, a year or two back, Noah came out and said that this was the hottest summer ever in Central Africa. Hottest ever on record, period. You know what they found out? Do you know how many temperature sensors Noah had in Central Africa? None. They'd never had a, central, a temperature sensor there. 
yet they were coming out with statements, our temperature sensors are telling us it's the hottest ever. Again, not true. A few years back, I'm probably mispronouncing her last name, I'll get as close as I can, Christiana uh, Pergerns, how she pronounced it, was the executive secretary of the UN's Framework Convention on Climate. She also is the, one of the primary authors of the Paris Accords. What it turns out, if you listen to that, is that she was caught off camera one time at the UN talking to some people about it when she came out and said, well, of course it's not about climate, it's all about the destruction of capitalism and redistribution of wealth, and that's how we, why we're using it. This is literally the, should have been the leading climate person in the world as a spokesman saying, that's got nothing to do with climate, we're using it to destroy capitalism. Now again, the reason I bring this up is not to try to convert people to agreeing or disagreeing with climate science. It's one thing. If you start looking at these facts, what they're doing is they're taking the facts to modify, or they're taking the theory to modify the facts instead of the facts to modify the theory. It doesn't make any sense from a scientific standpoint, but it is the facts that are being used, the facts are being changed to fit the theories. Now the reason I bring this up is because of this. We have a passage here, Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, which is very controversial and that again, the Facts are being modified in order to fit the theories of biblical interpretation. Matter of fact, some people believe that Romans 1 through 7, 1 through 6 shouldn't even be in the Bible. Ah, somebody's added it. It's not really there in the originals. The problem is it's in every original manuscript. There's no evidence whatsoever that it was added. In addition to that, C.H. Dodd, who's written many, many uh, commentaries, he said about these verses here that they are confused from the outset that the illustration has gone hopelessly astray, we shall do our best to ignore the illustration. And the reason for all this was because of Paul's lack of imagination. That's a pretty strong commentary on these verses. Another commentator said that, another commentator said that he believes that Paul was actually dictating to the amanuensis, who was the secretary, and then he forgot what he was doing, and the Emanuel is just writing down some random thoughts Paul had, and these six verses are nothing but random thoughts, and they have nothing to do with the Bible, and shouldn't be in the Bible. Now, I don't know if you know about the dictating theory, but if you ever watch Monty Python and the Holy Grail, when they find the, the castle Arg, okay, what happens is they find carved into the wall, they're trying to find out where the Grail is, and it says, here's the last words of Joseph of Arimathea, that you'll find the, the Grail at the castle Arg. And they say, well, why would they say the castle Arg? And somebody said, well, maybe he was just, he was killed while he was saying it, so he carved Arg into the law. I said, nobody would carve Arg, they just say it. And then somebody said, maybe he was dictating. As ridiculous as that sounds, that's the theory they're now applying to Romans 7, 1 through 6, that Paul was dictating and just happened to say these words, and therefore they just got stuffed into the Bible. The reason I'm saying here is that you're using the Theories to modify the facts is, number one, there's absolutely no evidence for this whatsoever. None. No textual evidence, no variance to drop out one through these six verses. In addition to that, the reason they're saying this is because they know that the Mosaic Law is still applicable and alive today. Therefore, since they know that, it couldn't possibly be true what Paul said. The problem, again, is they're not looking at what Paul said. They're looking at what their beliefs are beforehand and having their beliefs change the Bible. We need to let the Bible change us and believe what the Bible says, not the other way around. We don't change the Bible because we're uncomfortable with it. One of the things I will say also is if you read this passage in context and take it for what it actually says in its literal meaning, it's very easy to understand. It's not some convoluted passage. It's a passage that makes sense right off the bat. But they don't want to believe that because they want to let the facts be modified by their theories. Now let's start off with verse 1. Verse 1 says, Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. One of the things I've got to say here is in these verses, they're going to be talking about a married woman whose husband dies, especially in verses 1 through 3, and then he's talking about the Mosaic law, especially in verses 4 through 6. The thing that's easy to get confused is many people think this is a passage about the spouse dying. It is not. That's not the topic. That's the illustration. And if we don't keep that straight, things will get very mixed up. The topic is, is the Mosaic law dead and, or, or is it applicable to them still as believers in the New Testament church? That's what it comes down to. The illustration is the spouse that dies. Now, if we look at this, 
The first thing we say is, don't you know, brethren? It's Basically, it's obvious. Why is he saying that? Because this is something they should already know, and in addition to that, he says, I'm speaking to those who know. This was a mixed Jewish-Gentile church. Any Jew of that day would have known this is the Mosaic law. It says when the wife, when the husband dies, the wife is free. No problems there. So he's saying something that is really not controversial at this point in time so far. He's just saying, you know the law, the law has jurisdiction. The word here for jurisdiction is the word curio, which literally means to lord over. It's oppressive. It's something that if we get our word, the noun form, but is, to, to, is lord. And I don't mean just for Jesus. I mean, it could be anyone who's a master of something, okay? The point is, is that the, the law that he's talking about that has jurisdiction over this is an oppressive law. If you look at the Mosaic Law, the Mosaic Law is not filled with exceptions. It's not filled with, oh, if it's Tuesday and you don't feel like it, don't worry about it, no big deal. Remember what happened to a guy named Uzzah when the Ark of the Covenant started falling down the hill? He reached up to stabilize that Ark of the Covenant. What happened? God struck him dead. Doesn't that sound like that should have been an exception moment? It wasn't. Now, there are reasons why that happened. We're not going to go into here. Into here. That's actually a different message. But the point being is that there was not there was, the Mosaic Law was not built for exceptions. It was meant to be a rule to lord over the people, essentially. So right here we're seeing that, that, that Paul is saying, look, you, especially the Jewish brothers in this church, you already know this law. It says also, let me see, it says also that, that it, has, it has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. So if the man dies, suddenly the woman is free to remarry. If you look at verse 2, verse 2 says, for the, married, or for the married woman is bound by the law to her husband while he is living, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. It gets even more explicit here, where it's saying, look, if you're married and your husband dies, you're free to marry again. If you marry again and your husband is not dead, you're a bigamist or an adulterer. If you are married and you want to go dating, you are not free to do that. That's not right. And when it says dead, it means totally dead, not mostly dead, as we heard before. The husband had to be totally dead, but when he's totally dead, she is not only free to remarry and free to date again, free to find a husband again, but she can also do this without any guilt. There's no guilt to it because the law says you're free. You're free of that bondage. Okay? And when I say bondage, I mean that in a good way, in a, in a marriage sense. Okay? Yeah, well, I've got to clarify that. One. Sorry about that here. Uh, so the point being is that you're free to remarry at that point in time. Whether you want to is another matter, but you're certainly free to do that, and the Mosaic Law allows that. Now, if we look at verse 3, we're going to fairly quickly through the first three verses because we're going to take more time on the last three. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she be joined to another man. Again, restating the obvious, this is really, the first three verses is really a pretty simple proposition. Your husband's dead, you can remarry. Your husband's not dead, you can't remarry. Pretty simple, you can't date, you can't remarry, you can't do anything. Yeah, I've got to see that the husband dies, and I think it works the other way around, too, if the wife dies, and the husband is free to remarry. But remember, this is not the topic, this is the illustration, and that's important to remember here. Let me ask you a question. I have one person in this room, I bet, that might actually get this, even without context. Does anybody know what happened on January 17th, 1920? Not enough context? Okay. I thought, I thought I'd give you a try anyway. I know a lot about history, but I also know Clinton knows more than I know. In 1920, on January... Hmm? I don't know that particular... I know. Well, it's out of context. It's, it's not a fair question. In 1920, on January 17th, the 18th Amendment went into effect, and what happened is it was prohibited to transport, sell, or manufacture alcohol in the United States for drinking. Okay, so it's a medicinal alcohol, but you couldn't make alcohol anymore for drinking. In 1933, there was a repeal of the 18th Amendment, which is the 21st Amendment, and that was on December 5th, 1933. Don't know if it's a true story or apocryphal, but people supposedly asked Elliot Ness what he was going to do on December 5th, 1933. And his answer was, I think I'll have a drink. He was enforcing the law, not because it was he cared about it, but, he, but, but it was the law, therefore it had to be enforced. If you took a drink, 
on December 4th, 1933, you were still violated. Actually, take that back. You could drink, believe it or not, you could drink under prohibition. You couldn't sell, manufacture, or transport liquor. Let's say you sold a drink on the 4th of December, you were in violation of the law and go to prison. On the 5th of December, that law was dead. You could do anything you wanted with the alcohol. There was a point in time where suddenly it died. When it died, the law was no longer in effect. That's similar to what we're seeing here is Paul saying, look, with the marriage situation, when the widow dies or when the person dies, the widow is free to remarry. And then he's going to take this. You know, you might say, why is Paul going through all of this? Why? Because all of a sudden he's going to apply this to Mosaic law and the Mosaic law is going to make sense. If we turn to point or verse 4, and this is where we get to the meat of the story, it starts with the word therefore. Haste in Greek. Whenever you see the word therefore, I know it's trite, but you do want to look for what it is there for. You see, therefore, sense, any words like that saying, hey, what's this there for? What this means is you can't start a verse with therefore and just decide I'm going to go on from here and know what's going on because you've got to look back and see what's it based on. If you see therefore, first you want to go backwards. Well, we just did the backwards, the first three verses. And Paul was saying, in light of what I just told you about widows, here's the real point of the story that I'm going to get to now, and here's what we're going to be learning about this. And in light of this, he says, therefore, my brethren, you were also made to die to the law through the body of Christ, that you might be joined to another in him who was raised from the dead, that we might bear fruit for God. Paul is actually saying here that the Mosaic law is dead. Now, when we say that, the first thing I usually hear is, wait a second, I got you, Matthew 5.17. I know Matthew 5.17, the law's not dead, because Matthew 5.17 says, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Well, that doesn't sound like a dead law, does it? Well, there's two things we have to remember. Number one, when Christ said that, he was under the Mosaic law. Last week when Robin was talking about the fact that the, the Gospels were written under the Mosaic Law, he's absolutely right. It wasn't until after the death of Christ that the Mosaic Law went away. Galatians 4.4 4 says that Christ was born under the law. So we know that the law was in effect in the Gospels. But at a certain point in time, and I believe at the death of Christ is when it happened, that's when the Mosaic Law became out of effect. But here we got again Christ saying, I came to not abolish, I came... Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. But there's another important thing here also. Because the word for abolish is the Greek word kataluo. Now, don't worry about what it is, but here's the point. Kataluo literally means to destroy, to obliterate. If I took and ran at that wall and ran right through the wall and knocked it down, that would be kataluo. I'm going to run right through it to demolish. I'm going to just obliterate the wall, okay? I don't know if I can do that or not. Probably not. But anyway... The point being is, it's to destroy. And when Christ said, I came to destroy, he came, did not come to destroy the law, that never did change. Here's why. If Christ had abolished the law, it would have literally been saying, hey, you know that law, you know that Mosaic law thing? Don't worry about it, no big deal. If you didn't follow it, who cares? That would have been abolishing the law. He didn't. The law was effective until the point that until the point that he died. And even after that, the Mosaic Law still truly states what the Mosaic Law is. But it's not binding on believers today. Which probably brings another couple questions we're going to get into, we're going to get into here as well is, well, wait a second, if the Mosaic Law is dead, does that mean anything goes? No, it doesn't. We're going to get to that in a minute or two. One thing I want you to look at here also, when Paul says about dead to the law, that is an aorist passive verb in the Greek. Now, the word I want you to focus on is passive. Verbs come in three types, even in English, active, passive, and middle. An active verb means you're doing something. A middle verb means you're doing something to yourself or for yourself. A passive verb means something's being done to you, okay? For example, if I say, I run, I run across the street, you know, that's a, an active verb, I'm running. If on the other hand I say, I was run down by a truck, that's passive, I'm being, the truck's doing the action, I'm get, taking the action. Well, here's what's interesting. That word was used for dying to the law and literally that word dying to the law means made to die to the law is the best way to put it. Now what's the difference between made to die to the law and dying to the law? Dying to the law might imply that we're doing it. We didn't do anything to do this. We were made to die to the law because it was God himself who did this and God himself who provided the sacrifice to make us so that we could be acceptable in his presence. 
So that's why it's saying passive, saying that believers are made to die to the law. In addition to that, it was by Christ's body. We can see that in verse 4 where it says, through the body of Christ. When he says through the body of Christ, if you remember two weeks back, we talked about propitiation. Propitiation was literally a sacrifice made to satisfy the wrath of a God. In this case, God himself. And the sacrifice was Jesus Christ. So the point being is it was literally the death of Christ, the sacrifice of his body, that was the means to end the law. Without the death of Christ, without that sacrifice, the Mosaic law could not have ended. Could not have been fulfilled. By the way, when it says ended, one word where Christ said, I didn't come to abolish but to fulfill. Fulfill is a good way to think about what Christ did. He actually completed the law. He made it, he made it so that it was no longer of effect by completing it. He ended it. But he did it through, the, through his death. In addition to that, we see that so that we can be joined to another. What's he talking about there? Remember the illustration. The illustration is you can be joined to another man if your first husband dies. That's cool. No problem. No guilt or anything. Why did we have to die to the Mosaic Law? So that we could be joined to Jesus Christ as a believer. So that we could literally be, at the moment we get saved, we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. There is a distinct change in us. We are a new creation at that point in time. So that's what he's talking about there as far as born, joined to another. He's literally talking about becoming one with Christ. Now there's something I should say here. This word, this word joined to another. Again, in this passage, we kind of have to go into the Greek several times to see what it really means. The word in the Greek is the word ginomai. The word ginomai is the word that would typically be used to say that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. Literally, the word ginomai means to be born to. So when it says we are joined to another, it literally is saying we are born to another. In becoming a Christian, we actually are joined to Christ as if we're birthed into the body of Christ. And again, the tide of the Mosaic Law had to be severed first because if you look at the Mosaic Law, the Mosaic Law, the Mosaic Law was never meant to save, and that's what the Jews also missed a lot of times. They would see it as a way to be righteous. Well, you can't be righteous. You can try, but you can't be fully righteous. It was never meant to actually save anyone because, you know something? Nobody could complete the law satisfactorily and fulfill it all. That's why we have to be saved through what Christ did instead of our own righteousness. The other thing as well as being born into another is that the word here for another is actually hetero. Now, we've got three or four words at least that can be used for another in the Greek, but hetero is the word that's used when it's another of a different kind. For example, we have a word like heterosexual. Obviously, you know, when you talk about male versus female, we're all people, but we're definitely distinct, okay? So the point being is that when he's saying born to another, it's literally born to another of a different kind. What he's saying is Jesus Christ and salvation is not like the Mosaic Law. These two things are here. They both, they both are pointing to God. Well, Christ and salvation, the Mosaic Law is pointing to God. But the point is they're not the same. And there never should be an equivalence between the two. And then we see also that basically we can't get rid of, we, we can't get, until the law was dead, we could not be joined to Christ. And that's why I believe also that it died at the moment Christ died. Now, one of the reasons you might be asking also is why is he even talking about the law? Why is this even going on? One of the things we hear today, you've probably heard this, if you ask somebody, is the law still in effect? Well, there were three parts of the law. There's the moral part, there's the civil part, and there's the ceremonial part. And the civil and the ceremonial parts of the law have died, but the moral part's still in effect. There's one problem with that. That's not in the Bible. The Bible never says that. The Bible says in multiple places, especially in Romans and Galatians, the law is dead, speaking about the Mosaic law. So how in the world can we have this if the law is dead, including the moral law? What, it's okay to murder now? It's okay to steal? It's okay to do this and that? How can we have that that it's not just everybody do what you want? And here's the answer to that one. When it says the law is dead, it's talking about specifically the Mosaic Law and not all law. Let me ask you a question. Mosaic Law was written about 1400 B.C. If in 1700 B.C., previous to that, somebody says, I'm going to kill somebody, was it okay because the Mosaic Law didn't exist? Certainly not. When Cain killed Abel, long before that, it was still murder, it was still sin. God didn't say, oh darn, I should have written that Mosaic Law so you'd have been responsible for this one. It didn't work that way. The reason is because right and wrong have always been defined by the character of God. 
when the Mosaic law died, the moral part of the Mosaic law died, a whole Mosaic law died, but morality didn't die, right and wrong didn't die. That has always existed separate completely from the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law was God's way of reaching out to Israel specifically and dealing with them. It wasn't meant to say this is comprehensive for all time, for all people, and, and all, all activities. One thing to think about this, as far as a good, a good way to think about it is, if you committed a murder in Maryland, and you went to Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania arrested you and put you in, in, in gravity court, could they try you for murder? Nope. They can't do it. Why? You'd have to be extradited back to Maryland so that the place that has jurisdiction over the murder would be able to try you. They can pick you up on the arrest warrant, but they can't try you for the murder in Pennsylvania. Murder is a state crime, and therefore they have to bring you back to where you committed the murder. The point being is that if you look at the Mosaic Law, it was really, Paul was really saying, it no longer has jurisdiction over anyone at the point in time when Christ died. So the end of the law, the death of the law, doesn't mean that right and wrong died. It means the Mosaic Law is no longer the, the applicable terms. If you committed a murder, you're still guilty in the eyes of God because murder was always wrong, but not because of the Mosaic Law anymore. It's a different jurisdiction, and that's what he's talking about there. Sometimes we forget also that sin is anything against the character of God, basically. Right and wrong is defined by God himself, and that has always existed. That doesn't change. In addition to that, if we look at the end of this verse 4, it says that the purpose of this is to say we might bear fruit for God. Do you ever think about that? When we become a believer, why are we believers? So that we can bear fruit to God? Pretty high responsibility, to be honest with you. But not only that, if you also were to cross-reference to Ephesians 1, you'd find out what is the purpose of a believer? To glorify God. That's what a believer is supposed to be. Everything we do should come under the title of glorify God. That's simple. We're to bear fruit from, for God. We can see this here. And what Paul was saying is, you can't be bearing fruit for God under the Mosaic Law and then be a believer because they don't match with each other. The distinction. The one died. If you were under the Mosaic Law and the Christ at the same time, it would be the same as an adulteress. Two masters which we'll get to in a minute here. And we'll look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for the flesh. What's he talking about? Well, when, when in the flesh, he's first of all talking about prior to salvation. Sinful passions, pretty obvious. We want what we want. I think maybe, maybe the key words for sin should start with, I want. Because that's where most sin starts. And when he talks about the members also, don't forget, sin starts in our mind. You never have something like, oh darn, my arm ran out the other day and slugged somebody. Sorry about that. I had nothing to do with that. Didn't even think about that. Of course not. It starts with the mind. And, it, and our body follows what our mind tells it to do. But it says also that these fleshly passions were aroused by the law. I have a suggestion for this. We are in rebellion to God as unbelievers, when we're unbelievers. And I don't know about you, but I know most kids, when they're in rebellion, when they're told to do something, they may do it, but there's a little piece of them that's going like, eh, should I really be doing that? You know, I don't really want to do that. I've often wondered if you could get kids to clean their rooms by telling them, don't you dare clean your bedroom. <laughs> and maybe that's the way to do it. But the point is, is that what I'm saying is that we have this natural rebellion that leads us into sin. And you think back that that's a normal thing. Not only that, but the law shows sin. If we don't know about the law, and the law, I mean, the Mosaic, he was speaking about the Mosaic law, the law, the law was showing sin. If they didn't know about the Mosaic law, they didn't realize they were sinning at that point in time, maybe. And that it provided opportunity because the more laws you have, the more chances there are to violate the law. Think about this if there are no speed limits out front, how fast would you have to go in order to be ticketed? No speed limits, you do what you want. You, want, you got a car with 200? Cool. The point is that the more laws you pass, the more chances there are to violate the law. That's what he was saying in the Mosaic Law here is the violations were occurring because the law made it clear and the law had to make it. Let me say something also that Paul said as well. The law was holy. There's nothing about the law that was unholy or wrong. The reason it showed that the people started doing wrong is because it showed them how holy God was and they could never live up to God's standards. Now, in addition to that, if we go to verse 6, which is where I want to be now, it says, but now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that, the, that we serve in the newness of the spirit 
and not the oldness of letter. When we look at this as far as being released from the law, this goes back again to the illustration and why Paul used the marriage illustration. Think about the other people who have been saying, oh, Paul didn't know what he was talking about. The illustration was hopelessly confused. He's not confused at all. You look at the illustration, Paul says, just like when the, when the spouse dies, you're free to remarry. He's saying the release from the law happens when Christ died. When Christ died, we were no longer under the Mosaic law. We were discharged from it. We were estranged from it. And not only that, this word here is having died to what, having died to the law, we died to what we were bound to. Now, literally, he's speaking to the Roman believers there. They would have been very familiar. Many, the Jews would have been. The Jewish portion would have been very familiar with the Mosaic law. That would have been something that was part of their life until recently. And he's trying to tell them, you're not under that anymore. We serve in newness of spirit. Newness of spirit may be referring simply to the Holy Spirit, but I think what it's actually referring to is the union of the Holy Spirit and ourselves as a new creation. That the new creation has control or should have control of us. That we need to allow the Holy Spirit to control us. And that this, this serving in newness of spirit is talking about the fact that before that, before they were believers, they didn't have the Holy Spirit in them to guide them. As believers, they have the Holy Spirit. In church age, church age, when a person is believes on Christ, they get the Holy Spirit immediately. And then it says here again about not in the oldness of the letter of the law. The letter of the law, you ever think about this? The letter of the law destroys relationships. How many relationships do you have that are really, really close relationships based on, I've got a list of do's and don'ts? It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't really hold up. Now, I've rushed through these six verses a little bit to interpret, but I want to talk a little bit about application now, what we just talked about. Number one, at first application, is it okay for a widow to remarry? Yes, done. No guilt, totally free, no problem. Widow, widower, doesn't make any difference. It's free for them to remarry. That's not the point of the passage. That's the illustration. What we can see from the illustration, yeah, they're free to remarry. No problem there. The second application, what's wrong with a little bit of law? I mean, after all, doesn't it make us just a little bit more holy if we also follow these extra laws? What if we just, let's keep the Sabbath. Let's, you know, do whatever. I'm just throwing this out. What if we, matter of fact, no tattoos in the Old Testament. That was against the Mosaic law. There's no more tattoos. Wouldn't that make us a little extra holy? No. There's no such thing as trying to be extra holy. We are already holy because of Christ's righteousness, which has been applied to us. We're not holy because of something that we did. We became believers, and at that point in time, we became holy in Christ because of his actions, not our own actions. We should act holy because we're acting out what we already are. But the point being is, since God has made us holy by applying Christ's righteousness to us, we should be acting like that. But we didn't do it. We're not the ones that actually did it. And when you start saying, what about a little law, let's go back to the illustration. Two masters and adultery. When we want to say we're a believer in Christ, but we're also going to follow parts of the Mosaic Law, what we're really saying is we're committing spiritual adultery. That's a harsh way to put it, but Paul's the one who said it. Now again, that doesn't mean we're free to do anything, because free to do anything is totally different. But it means that it's based on what's right and wrong, and what we're told in the New Testament, not because of the Mosaic Law. In addition to that, forgiveness is complete. The law never completely forgave anyone. You do sacrifices but with the whole, so God would hold his wrath in the Old Testament, but the payment wasn't made until Christ died. The Old Testament animal sacrifices never paid for sin in any permanent fashion. It was simply to hold off God's wrath because the payment was coming when Christ died. And let me ask you another question here, back to the rules. Let's think about this with serving to, with just a little bit of law mixed in with belief in Christ. If you were married, well, so many of us are married. If we're married and we say, here's rule number one. You got to make me dinner five times a week. Rule number two, we're going to be intimate this many times each week. We're gonna, rule number three, you have to kiss me five times a day. Just walk up and kiss me for no reason. Number four, you have to come up and tell me, you're such a wonderful person, I love you, seven times a day. Boy, wouldn't that really be reassuring and tell us that our spouse, we had a close relationship with them? No. We'd go like, what are you talking about? What do you mean laws to do that? If it's spontaneous and normal, that's fine, but we don't have laws to govern our relationship like that. That's what overlaying the Mosaic Law onto the Christian believers is doing, is essentially saying, here are the laws you're going to do through the Mosaic Law, 
and it doesn't work. All it does is it destroys relationship. Remember, salvation is about relationship. You can't get away from that. Matter of fact, I would say this salvation is almost a symptom of the relationship, if that makes sense. What I'm saying is you can't have a salvation without relation. And that's what brings us into relationship with God. And to put these extra mosaic law rules into it doesn't work, even if it's only part-time. Number three, we can see that God did the work, the third application. We were made to die to the law. It was Christ's body, it was his propitiation, and something else that's an important application out of this. It means we have no reason to be proud. We didn't do it. How can you be proud of something we didn't do? Oh, look at what I did, but I didn't really do it. That's not good, that's not good for pride. The work is complete and done by God, therefore we have no right to say, hey, I'm going to be proud of this. And that's a good thing. Now, I want to hit one last thing here as an application. And what I want to hit is the freedom to bear fruit for God. Believe it or not, what I'm talking about here is something that Paul faced exactly in the book of Romans as well, where people would say, well, if there's no more Mosaic law, then we can do anything we want, right? You'll try reading verses, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, where Paul says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Paul was saying, can we just keep on sinning? What are you talking? What were you thinking? Of course not. It doesn't work that way. I do know of a case where I was told by some people up in Canada where the, the uh, youth minister of a church was taking one of the congregants and leading him and says, come on, let's go to a strip club here. He took him into a strip club. And finally, something in the congregant's mind said, what am I doing? And the reason was because the youth minister was saying, hey, Christ paid the penalty. I'm free to do anything. I don't, it's not sin anymore. I don't care. Christ paying all for, paying for all the sins. What's it matter? He was literally taking the congregants to a strip club. At least that one congregant knew that, hey, that's not right. I got to do something about this. The purpose of salvation is to glorify God. The reason we have this again is, when I say we're not under the Mosaic law, I don't mean there's no right and wrong. There is still right and wrong. There's still things God expects of us. There's still things God wants of us. I talked about the rules for marriage. There are some rules for marriage. Don't commit adultery. Don't do things. You see what I'm saying? There are still things that are right and wrong. If you're cheating on your spouse, it's wrong, period. I don't care what it is. And not only that, it's easy to talk and single out something like, you know, the homosexual movement or something like that. Not justifying them. Don't get me wrong. But it's just as wrong to commit adultery. It's not that we forget that. We got, well, that's a little different. No, adultery is wrong, period. There are still things that are right and wrong. Now, fortunately, not as many. Robin mentioned the 613 rule, uh, commands in the, in the uh, Mosaic Law last week. He was right. It's not just one. Not only that, you couldn't eat shrimp. You couldn't eat lobster. You couldn't eat crabs. You couldn't eat bacon. You couldn't eat ham. You just cut out most of my diet right there, except for chocolates, I think. So the point being is, no, I don't want to be under the Mosaic Law. That is part of the Mosaic Law right there. You can't pick and choose what you're going to do from the Mosaic Law. <coughs> By the same token, there are still things that are right and wrong. That never changes. And I want to leave you with one last thing to think about here as far as the right and wrong goes. If you ever have a question on whether it's right, right or wrong, ask yourself this one question. Can I glorify God while doing this? If you can't glorify God while doing it, there's a problem. And we get that out of Ephesians 1, is that our purpose is to glorify God, to bear fruit for God. That doesn't mean we're going to be 24-7, either in church or evangelizing or something else. Frankly, you can do things that are right, and you can glorify God by spending time with your spouse and having, you know, having building your relationships and things like that. You can go to work and provide income for your spouse, no problem with that, as long as it's a work that doesn't violate your conscience. But I would say to this, I say this, if you want to know, should you be doing it or not today, the question to ask is, can I glorify God by doing this? If you can't, you shouldn't be doing it. If you can, cool. Not a problem. We're not under some giant legal system anymore. And then I have to say to you, when you think about it in your life, are you ready to say I'm going to glorify God in my actions and my thoughts? Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you for who you are and what you've done. We thank you for the righteousness you've provided for us. We thank you that we are not under the Mosaic Law, that we have freedoms that the Israelites did not have. 
but we're also thankful that your character still shows us what's right and wrong. Father, I thank you for all you've done. I do ask that if anyone in here that doesn't know you already as their Lord and Savior, that the Holy Spirit would open their eyes, that they'd be able to see, and that they'd come to know you and to know how much you actually love them. I thank you for all this, and I ask all this in Christ's name.